So welcome to London Learning Lean. Uh, next week, we've got Elena Gusikov, who's going to give us an introduction to Matroid theory in Lean. Uh, but this week, we're very pleased to welcome all the way from Cambridge, uh, Bavik Mesa, who's going to tell us about the erdos semeradi conjecture and working with finiteness. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, I'm Bavik. I've been doing Lean for about two and a bit years now. Um, I've been doing lots of common works and lots of much more common rhetorics, um, why I think it's interesting to formalize in Lean, a particular problem which I've formalized recently, and how it is to work with finiteness in Lean. Um, so let me just give you some idea of what sort of problems I'll be talking about. Uh, the main thing which I need to discuss is the sum set. So we're going to fix uh, additive group G. I'm going to switch a lot between additive and multiplicative groups throughout. Hopefully, it should be clear which I mean. Um, and in some cases, I'll mean both. But for now, let's say I've got an additive group. I'm going to consider subsets of it called A. Usually, these will be finite. Um, then the sum set is just all the things you can get by adding two elements up from A. Um, so I've defined it there. It's just all the things um, by adding two elements, what can you get? And you can do the same thing for multiplicative groups. Uh, yeah, we usually take A finite. Um, and it's worth noting at this point that G only needs to be a semi-group for this to make sense. Um, that's nice to note from a formalization point of view, but also I'll be doing this later when G is the real numbers. And in that case, the real numbers aren't a multiplicative group unless I insist that we don't have zero, which will come into play later. Um, one natural thing you can ask once you've defined the sum set is how much bigger is the sum set relative to the original set? And this gives rise to the notion of doubling. And the additive doubling is essentially defined as that ratio. How much bigger is the sum set compared to the original set? And similarly, we have the multiplicative doubling. Um, and in particular, the additive doubling is less than a given constant k, as long as a plus a isn't more than k times bigger than a. Um, now, one thing you might see is that if um, for any sub subset a, a will always have doubling the size of a. So saying that um, there is some doubling constant isn't at all interesting. What we'll do usually instead is fix k and let a be big. Um, so one thing you could ask is what happens if k is 1 or k is 2 or something like that, um, and try and classify which sets have small additive or multiplicative doubling. And yeah, I'll say small doubling to mean k in the appropriate case is small, um, small additive doubling and small multiplicative doubling, depending on which we're talking about. So we trivially have that k is at least one. Uh, this is because if we're in a group, a plus a can never be bigger than a, because you've always got to have at least a things in there. Um, and one thing you can define from here is k approximate subgroups. Um, now, obviously, I'm sure we're all familiar with the notion of a subgroup. It's a set where you're um, closed under multiplication or addition, as the case may be, and inverses. Um, but what you can do instead is define an approximate subgroup. And here, instead of saying that a plus a is the same thing as a, a times a, um, we're going to say that the doubling is small instead. So a k approximate subgroup is a finite subset which is closed under inverse and has small doubling. Um, so let's look at some examples of this, in particular where we have very small doubling. One thing you can immediately see is that any subgroup is a one approximate subgroup. Um, it's obviously closed on inverses, and the size of the multiplicative doubling can't be more than the size of the original set. Um, but you can look at small doubling in other cases. For example, cosets of an abelian group will have doubling, multiplicative doubling constant equal to one. Um, that's again not too hard to see. If you've got AH, um, and you look at AH times AH, that will just be A squared H, which will be the same size as H. Um, and in fact, this is a if and only if characterization almost. In particular, in an abelian group, the multiplicative doubling is exactly, actually not even abelian, in any multiplicative group, the doubling is exactly one, if and only if there's a finite subgroup H and an element A, such that A is um, 
a translate of that subgroup on both sides. Um, and you can actually improve this result slightly. So not just doubling one, but less than three over two. Um, and here the if and only if condition is that A takes up most of um, a coset like I just described. In particular, takes up at most at, at least two thirds of the coset. So when you have very small doubling, we have a really tight characterization on what the um, subset must be like. But what if I insist that G is equal to Z? Can I do better? Um, well, let's look at um, an abelian group instead of Z just for now. One thing you can see is that the um, size of the subset is bounded by the binomial coefficient. But if we are in a Z case, we also have a lower bound, which is better than our size of A lower bound we had before. Or you can actually say the size of the sum set is at least two times the size of the set minus one. So essentially two N minus one. And this is really easy to prove. What we're gonna do is take our set A, enumerate the elements A1 up to AN. Then you can essentially write down a chain of elements which must all be distinct. In particular, A1 plus A1, then A1 plus A2. And I keep changing the second term up until I get to A1 plus AN. And then I'll keep changing the first term. So A2 plus AN all the way up to AN plus AN. And here, um, I've got two n minus one elements written down on the right-hand side, and they must all be different. So we have a lower, um, a lower bound on the size of the sum set. And we actually have equality in that um, inequality I've written there. In particular, if I look at arithmetic progressions. So I've, I've written them here as C plus AK, where K can vary. And we've got a fixed difference A and a fixed first term C. Um, and these ones will achieve the 2a minus 1 bound. Uh, in fact, you can show that you get exactly 2a, 2a minus 1 if and only if you're in arithmetic progression. So these sets essentially have doubling 2. But there's an important generalization to this, which is called a generalized arithmetic progressions. And the idea here is that instead of just having one common difference, we can vary a lot. Is he coming back? Or D dimensions. So one way of viewing this is essentially instead of a line with equally spaced points, we have a grid or a multi-dimensional grid. And these will also have relatively small doubling, in particular at most two to the D. Um, and what's interesting about this is here we've got a good sub a good family of sets with relatively small doubling. But this is actually all of the subsets of N with small additive doubling. And this is the content of the Freiman Rouge theorem, which says that for a fixed k, if the additive doubling is less than k, then a is inside a generalized arithmetic progression with dimension and size, which are functions only of k, um, or like relative size, functions only of k, not depending on a, which is kind of what we were talking about earlier of I want to fix k and vary a. Um, this result was actually generalized hugely by um, Emmanuel Briard, Ben Green, and Terence Tao in 2012, um, where they did this theorem in a much more general context, in particular, not just for subsets of Z and not even just for abelian groups. They gave an exact classification of all approximate subgroups of arbitrary groups, um, which is yeah, an incredible result. You have to generalize the statement slightly because arithmetic progressions doesn't exactly make sense in that context. Um, and you have a whole bunch of um, really cool math there relating to nilpotent groups and how long the nilpotency chain can be will end up being bound in terms of K and stuff like that. Um, but I'm more interested in the case of Z, so I won't go into that detail too much. So we talked about the product set, the, the sum sets of arithmetic progressions. But what about the product sets of arithmetic progressions? And what about the sum sets of geometric progressions. How can we relate the additive and multiplicative structure of one set? Well, if A is in geometric progression, then it can have some set being essentially the maximum size. A nice example to have in your head here is if A is the powers of two up to some random constant, it's obviously a geometric progression, but the sum sets you can generate, you can essentially get to everything if you think of your numbers in binary. 
you'll essentially have no collisions in the numbers you're adding up and so you'll get to the maximum point. Uh, in the other direction, let's say that A is the easiest arithmetic regression, the integers from one up to N, and then you can ask how big is the product set? Um, and this was originally asked and answered in 1960 by Erdős and Tenenbaum, who gave this classification saying that the product set of the integers from one up to N is N squared over a log N to some power, where the power is about 0.086. Um, and this is sometimes called the multiplication table problem, because another way of viewing this is, let's look at the multiplication table, like you've seen from when you were a little kid, I'm sure, of the integers from one up to n. How many different numbers show up in that table? And that's the same thing as asking what's the size of a times a, um, where a is the appropriate set. And this is a nice example of a problem which is incredibly easy to state. You're just drawing a multiplication table and asking how many distinct numbers are in there. But the answer isn't at all obvious. Um, this result was actually generalized slightly earlier this year. So in January 2022, there was a preprint which gave the same result. Um, but instead of A being the arithmetic regression from 1 up to n, any arithmetic regression from of length n. So I included this to show that this is a really active area of maths. Um, even if some results, some statements are fairly easy to state, there's still lots of active research going on here. So I talked about if you have a small sum set, what's the product set like? And if you have a small product set, what's the sum set like? Can we have both being small at the same time? So this is the erdos semradi conjecture of 1983. Um, one explicit way of stating it is what I've written there, which is for every epsilon, then for big enough A, either the sum set or the product set is at least n squared minus some epsilon. So essentially, if your sets are big enough, then one of the sum set and all the product set must be essentially quadratically behaved. Um, and another way of saying that is with this little o notation. Um, if you're not comfortable with little o notation in the way that I've used it, you can think of it as the formal statement I've written above. Um, but it's more convenient to write it in this way. So that's what I'll do for the rest of the talk. Now this makes sense because we've seen that having small additive doubling tends to mean the multiplicative doubling is big and small multiplicative doubling tends to mean the additive doubling is big, but this is, is still a conjecture. Um, it could be the case that there's something which is somewhere between an arithmetic progression and a geometric progression, which has both of these set, sum set and product set bounded by a to the maybe 1.99. We, don't, we haven't ruled that case out yet. But there has been some partial progress towards a conjecture. So firstly, there's the trivial result, which I've mentioned before, that the maximum is at least one plus little o of one. Um, now, remember that the bound we want is two plus little o of one at the top. Um, the trivial bound is one, and everything we've got in between, all of the results I'll say now are going to be numbers in between those two. So the first result by Erdős and Samrady, actually said that you can get a power of 32 over 31. Um, then Elakesh made a huge improvement. There was some, I won't talk about every single improvement, just some of the milestones. Um, Elakesh in 1997 gave a power of five over four. And that proof actually works for subsets of the complex numbers, not just for the integers. Um, which is kind of surprising because the original problem was stated for integers but it seems like to get the best bounds for the integers, um, what seems to be the case is that you can prove it for the complex numbers instead. Um, then Soimoshi in 2009 improved the result further to four thirds, um, in this case to the positive reals, because again, working in a bigger field tends to make it nicer. Um, this is again, a landmark result. And since then the improvements have essentially been very small. Um, the first improvement was by Konyagin and Shekredov where they improved it by a tiny fraction, um, again, for positive reals. And the record is a tiny bit better than that, giving four thirds plus two over 1,167. That's the best bound we have at the moment. Um, and there's essentially no evidence to think that 
we shouldn't be able to get all the way up to two. But right now, we're only a tiny bit above four thirds. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight here is that Soimoshi gave, in 2005, gave a different proof of Ellicott's bound, where it explicitly said um, either the sum set or the product set must be at least c times a to the 5 over 4. Um, and this is the result which I formalized. Um, and so for the rest of this, I'm going to be focusing on how that formalization process went. Um, so the first question is, why did I choose to formalize combinatorics in the first place, and why this specific result? Uh, well, one reason is because combinatorics tends to have incredibly easy to state questions with very subtle proofs. So I mentioned the Erdős multiplication table problem earlier, um, but it still took a while to state and formal uh, to prove that result, uh, which I think is a really curious feature that the problems are fairly straightforward to write down, but hard to come up with and sometimes even to write the proofs. Um, another really nice feature about common rhetorics is that the proofs often use ideas from very different areas of maths. For example, the Feynman Ruge theorem goes through a whole bunch of stuff in order to get the classification of sets of small doubling of um, additive subgroups of the integers. In particular, we go through Minkowski's second theorem, which is from the geometry of numbers. We go through um, finite cyclic groups. We end up defining some triangle inequalities for sets and subspace, subspaces of finite fields. And all of these things are used to get this proof, which seems like it's just a question about how addition, addition behaves in the integers. Another really nice feature of combinatorics is that there are often inductive arguments and constructions, which are really intuitive on paper. And it's often fairly clear to see why your induction will terminate if you think about it in the right way. But actually formalizing is often quite tricky. Another feature which is related to this is that in common forks, you often want to write down one set and think of it in two or three different ways. So this is sometimes called a double counting argument, and we'll actually see one later. This is his world record. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be back. Oh, he's back. Hi. Sorry about that. I think my Zoom crashed. Uh, all right, I'll make you uh, coast. Uh, Thanks. Sorry about that, everyone. You, uh, uh, you just started talking about double counting. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, double counting arguments where you where you want to look at one set in two different ways. And we'll see an example later. Um, but this can often be quite tricky to formalize because you, you have one way of viewing the set, which might be the definition. I need to show that your set is a bunch of other things um, or view it from different angles, which is necessary for the proof. Now, this isn't always that tricky to formalize, but it's a sort of thing which is very rarely written down on paper why the two sets are equivalent, because it's often really clear on paper to a mathematician what's going on. Whereas when formalizing, you obviously need to go through these details. So I think features like that make common a really appealing area because the sorts of issues you need to deal with are kind of kind of highlight 
the difficult parts of formalization in fairly nice um, self-encapsulated problems. Um, another thing is that there's lots of active research in common forex. Like I mentioned, there are some results which have happened incredibly recently. Um, there are also a ton of open problems. The Erdosham Rady conjecture itself is still open. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of brand new proofs and ideas which are coming out very rapidly. So it's also an incredibly active area of mouse, which makes it fun to formalize. Okay, so let's talk a bit about how to state and prove this theorem. Um, the first thing I need to talk about is how we deal with finiteness. So throughout, I said that all of my subsets were finite. Um, and how are we going to express that in lean? There's two common ways of doing this, namely using fin sets or using finite sets, which sound different but have different implementations, which sound the same but have different implementations. Um, but what I want to talk about here is the fact that bundling finiteness in is incredibly helpful. For example, in MathLib, when I want to talk about a subgroup A of G, I say A is a subgroup of G, not I have a set which is a subgroup. It's this difference of I have a subgroup versus a set which is a subgroup. That's the same pattern when we define finite sets and the way I'll, I'll work with finite sets. When you're doing combinatorial applications, it's usually nicer to work with finite sets of the reals rather than sets of the reals which happen to be finite. Uh, one immediate advantage is that for something like the union of finite sets, you can just write down the union and throughout, you never need to prove that it's finite. You have that baked into the data. Um, one thing some people don't like about finite sets is that, or about fin sets, I should say, is that they're too computable. Um, I think that's an irrelevant problem when you're doing lots of combinatorics. In particular, it's gonna be completely irrelevant to me here. The computability of finite sets is gonna make no difference to what I'm doing, in particular because I'm working with subsets of the reals. So I've got no hope of anything being decidable or computable in the first place. Um, so the next thing we need to define is some sets and product sets. Um, and that's defined by a type class in Lean. I'm assuming that everyone here is okay with the type class system. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the product set in particular. Um, because we have some machinery like two additive, which is going to give me the additive version as well. So we have this has mul operation, which here is a definition given by you take all of the products, you take every, sorry, you take every element in the product set S times T and image it under the product operation. So this is essentially how you might define it if someone pressed you really hard to do it on paper. You take the set of pairs and then you apply the product operation to them all. Um, now this, there are, there are some cases where you don't want this to be what multiplication on finite sets looks like. So we use the localized trick in MathLib to make it work in general. The attribute is, sorry, this definition is only an instance when you're in the pointwise locale, which means that in some other cases, you can have a different multiplication. But in my case, I want this, so I will open the pointwise locale and just keep going. Um, and it's for addition. So we now have the sum set and product sets. This is already, already all in MathLib. Now we can immediately state the results, which I've called max bound here. And it says that for any finite set of reals, I have this explicit bound. Um, there are a couple of things to note here. First, I put the maximum on the right-hand side because that's standard throughout MathLib. Um, I've also given explicit constant one fifth here. Um, that's because the proof does give you an explicit constant and it's essentially easier to work through the proof when you have these explicit terms rather than big O or little O terms um, as you're going through the details of the proof. So hopefully this statement should be fairly readable. Um, if you take the cardinality of the set A, treat it as a real number, take it to the power of five or four and multiply that by a fifth, that's less than the maximum of the sum set and the product set. Did you uh, have here to define I, hazard? I didn't have to define hazard. Um, I would, but I just didn't include the line saying two additive, so it's yeah, easier okay. to read on the slide. Um, in MathLib, there is a two additive line. Exactly, I think you can see my cursor. Um, a two additive line right here, which makes it work. We can see your cursor. Great. 
Um, so yeah, there's there's a two additive line, um, which makes the plus sign work here. Um, great. I'm going to talk a little about how the actual proof works. Um, hopefully in just enough detail so you get an idea of what's going on. Um, what we'll actually prove is that the size of some sum set and some product set is bounded below. And then we're going to apply this when B and Q are both equal to A, and then chuck everything together to get our result. Um, in this equation I've put at the top here, there's no maximum, but that's fine because if the product is big, then one of the two must be big. Um, and the idea is that B will be the additive shifts of A, and Q will be the multiplicative shifts of, the A, of A. And it's kind of clearer to see if we split them up throughout the proof. Um, at the end, I'm just going to say A equals B equals Q and get the result back out. So here's the actual bound I want to say. Uh, I'm going to start with the second one, actually because this is the bound which was written on paper. Namely, if we have A, B, and Q as finite sets of reals, then the size of A times the size of, sorry, size of A cubed times the size of B times the size of Q is bounded by some constant times the relevant sum set squared and the relevant product set squared. Now, going through the proof, it turned out this actually needed that zero is not in Q. And it makes sense if you look at the statement, because if zero is in Q, then A times Q will be smaller than you expected it to be. So I originally stated this as real bound, but then as I went through, I realized I needed to add this assumption and then the name needs to change to real bound, but not really. And the actual bound that we get is the one I've given above. And the key difference is that I need to sacrifice a factor of two in order to allow for the fact that zero might be in Q. Um, there's another restriction here, which is that A and Q can't either be singleton zero. And in fact, the proof will also work if A and Q are both singleton zero, but it doesn't work if one of them is and the other one isn't. Um, and so at the end, when I'm going to tie this all together and I set A equals B equals Q, it's going to be fine because the case when A is singleton zero is trivial. Um, OK. So yeah, this is a nice illustration of the sort of thing which often doesn't matter on paper, because whether zero is in there or whether your set is tiny is completely irrelevant. But it's the sort of thing that does need to be worried about when you're formalizing. So how are we actually going to prove the result? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about neighbors. Um, this is something which is fairly easy to find, but it's going to show up a bunch throughout the proof. Um, I'm going to define A prime, and this is, I'll use the notation in maths prime for this. Um, in lean, I won't bother because making that notation is more pain than it's worth. But A prime will be a neighbor of A inside A if it's the closest thing in A, in big A to little a. So essentially, if we're imagining the set capital A as a blob, then when you look at your element A, the closest thing to it that's not itself is going to be a neighbor. Um, I said the closest thing here. Um, and that's because I might be worried about ties. And I'm just going to say that a set can, a, an element can have multiple neighbors. If I need to pick one, I'll just pick one randomly. Um, I'll just break the ties arbitrarily. It makes no difference if that happens. Now, one thing you might hope is that A prime plus B, so the neighbor of A plus B, is a neighbor of A plus B as long as A prime is a neighbor of A. If you do make this assumption, and same for the multiplicative version, you get an incredibly strong version of the result. But this might not be true. So this is kind of what you are, would hope for um, when you're going through the proof. Um, the reason this would be nice is then um, you can classify, you can understand exactly where the additive translations of your elements might be once you've um, taken the neighborhood operation. But this might not be true. So we define good triples for one where this is approximately true. We've got approximate groups, we've got approximate rings. We might talk about 
approximately nice triples. In particular, a good triple um, is a triple little a, little b, little q from capital A, capital B, capital Q, where the pair AB is additively good and the pair AQ is multiplicatively good. Um, so essentially, I want the neighborhood of A plus B inside big A plus big B to have not much more stuff other than A prime plus B. So I'll say that again, because it's not the most obvious statement. What I want is inside A plus B, the number of things which are closer to A plus B than A prime plus B is, has some bound. Uh, one way to view this bound is that the probability of the bad thing happening, if I pick a random element of A plus B, is 12 over the size of A. Um, why 12 over the size of A is the right definition isn't completely obvious. The answer is essentially that's what makes the proof work. And there's no not really better intuition for why that works. Um, but we'll see that as we go through the proof, that's the sort of term which is going to drop out. Um, and multiplicatively, we'll have the same thing. So um, AQ will be multiplicatively good if the number of, oh, that's a typo there, that should be a V. The number of things which are closer to AQ than A prime plus Q is has some bound. Um, up here, you might notice that I can cancel out the Bs, um, but I've kept them there just to make it clearer what the statement is. Um, when I write the formal version, I'm going to cancel out the Bs, which you can see here. So I've defined the neighbor. Um, and what's happening here is if there are other elements in capital A than A, that's the same thing as A removed A being non-empty, then I can show there must exist a neighbor, which is the content of this lemma. Um, I haven't given that, but I think you can guess what the statement is. It's essentially, if this set is non-empty, there is an element who is a neighbor. And then I'm using classical.sum to pick that element because I'm just picking it completely randomly. As long as it is a neighbor, I don't care which one is picked. But if A without little a's is empty, then there's not really a sensible choice. And so going with the usual lean principle of defining junk values, I'm just going to say it's A plus one. Um, one question you might ask here is why do you say A plus one and not A or not zero or something? The reason for that is um, mostly just for convenience. Later on, it's nice to say the neighbor is not equal to the original element, because that's something we should always have, that the neighbor is a different thing. And if I use A plus one, then that's got to be different from A. Um, any other definition here would have worked, because this is a junk value anyway. I can then define what additively good triples are, or really an additively good pair, which is going to go into the definition of, an ad of a good triple. And it's almost exactly what I stated before. So we're going to go through the elements of A plus B. I'm going to filter based on the condition that U is closer to A plus B than the neighbor of A was. And the number of those things has got to have this bound. So this is almost a literal translation of what I had on the previous slide, uh, which is written here. So yeah, I've canceled out the Bs, but otherwise this is the same definition. Um, now, what our proof is going to be, I'm going to count, try and count the number of good triples. I'm going to try and get a lower bound on the number of good triples and an upper bound on the number of good triples. And this is the double counting argument that's going to give my results straight away. Um, but how do I get these two bounds? Well, the first thing I'm going to claim is that if I take, if I fix B and Q, then half of the possible choices of little a will make a, b, q into a good triple. So I'll say that again. If I fix little b and little q, then over half of the choices of little a will make a, b, q into a good triple. So the number of good triples I have must be at least half the size of a times the size of b times the size of q. Um, the reason this is true, well, I'm going to show that well, I showed that at less than a quarter of the triples can be additively bad. 
and similarly less than a quarter of the triples can be multiplicatively bad, therefore at least half of them must be good. And that's, that's, how, we, that's how we're going to prove that half of them must be good. The reason this works is you, you can essentially look at the balls around each point A plus B and think about if I pick any element from big A plus big B, how many of these sets on the left-hand side can it be in? The idea is that it can't be in too many of them because you can't be in too many disjoint balls. Now, the radius of the ball here is essentially A prime minus A. And we know that no other A can be inside that ball because of the definition of neighbor. So we have these balls which are essentially disjoint. And if you imagine, um, sorry, I shouldn't say disjoint. Uh, we have balls and no ball contains in its interior the center of another ball. So these balls aren't disjoint, but by the definition of what a neighbor is, none of these balls will, in its interior, contain another center. It turns out if you have a collection of balls with this property, then no nothing can be in more than three of those balls. That's what's stated by this real covering lemma. Um, so I've got a bunch of balls. Their centers will be given by x, the radii given by r. Each radius is going to be positive. And I have this pairwise disjointness property, which isn't really a disjointness property. But it says that um, this condition here, which essentially means that xj can't be in the interior of the ball labeled i. In that case, any real number z can be in at most three of these balls. Would that be true for complexes? Is this where we use reals? This is where we use reals, importantly. Um, for complex numbers, it's true if you change three to seven. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and it should, it's true for um, finite dimensional real vector spaces if you change three to five to the power of the dimension. Which does not give you three. Which is weaker than the version <laughs> we have here. Um, I think maybe with an extra factor of two, because that doesn't. What if he's coming back this time? I think he's gone again. I'm sorry about that. I think sorry, the internet crashed again. Yeah, 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 you've just got dodgy internet. It's not usually this bad. I'm really sorry. Um, everyone can hear me and see my screen now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, we were talking about five to the dimension. Great. Yes. Um, so this can be made to work with re um, finite dimensional real vector spaces. Um, I did it just for the reals. Um, it's, um, I'll talk about this more later, but essentially the only barrier for doing this for the complex numbers is the way you get seven here is by doing some essentially very basic geometry of the complex numbers. In particular, you need to say that if I have six points in the complex plane and none of them are the origin, then one of the angles must be at least um, 60 degrees. And that's completely obvious on paper, but we don't have enough stuff about angles in MATLAB, at least when I worked on this. I was going to say, yeah. well, didn't we have a breakthrough about last week, right? Exactly. Um, so maybe as of last week, I could do the uh, complex version, but I didn't want to change the talk and redo all the work just in case. Um, so at least, yeah, when I did this, it was pretty hard to do the complex version. Maybe as of last week, it's easier. Um, so that could be a fun project if anyone wants one change this number to seven, and then redo all the work. Um, but the other key thing about this number being three is that um, this lets you say 
that a quarter of the triples must be additively bad because of the choice of the number 12 here. Um, because each, any element can be in, can witness the badness of at most three things. And so if more than a quarter of the pairs are additively bad, then the inequality with the three must break. So essentially what I'm saying is 12 is three times four. And that's why the proof works. Uh, what that means is that if the three would change to a seven, then the 12 here would need to change to um, seven times four um, to make the rest of the proof go through. So this gives us a lower bound on the number of good triples, in particular, about half the choices work. To get the result out, we also need a bound in the other direction. And what I'm, what the idea of this is, is that once you've written down a plus b, a prime plus b, a q, and a prime q, where again the prime means the neighbor, you can recover a b q as long as q is not zero. And this is where the issue comes in, like before, that if things are zero, it gets a little bit trickier. Um, and so this is exactly why I had the issue with the real bound, but not really because of this zero issue. And that's why I say mostly in brackets here, because you do need to worry about that. Um, and what this means is that the function from ABQ to the quadruple on the left is basically an injection. And so what I can do is count the size of the number of quadruples I have here um, in order to get a bound on the number of triples I could have had on the right-hand side. In particular, if I knew that the original triple was good, then once I've picked a plus b, you have at most 12 times the size of a plus b over the size of a choices for a prime plus b. Um, and again, this number is the same number that happened on the right-hand side of the inequality. Um, the reason you have at most that many choices is um, looking at this, the definition of being good again. Um, you essentially have only the 12 times a plus b over a closest neighbors to a plus b will make it good. So that's the number of options you have for a prime, a prime plus b. So we can then define the nearest neighbors, like I just said. In particular, the left good quads is essentially just a, the left-hand side of this, a plus b and a prime plus b. And the choices for those is no more than once you've chosen your thing from a plus b, um, sigma meaning we've made that choice, I'll say it's u, what are the choices I can make for the second side, for the second part? Well, it's gotta be one of these nearest neighbors. And so this inequality I've written down here, it just says that the number of choices of the left-hand side pair is given by making choice that term, and then picking one of the nearest neighbors for that. And if you simplify this relation out, you get a really good bound on the left good quads. In particular, the size of the nearest neighbor set here is exactly this size. And the size of A plus B is obviously the size of A plus B. So when you stick that together, um, the same thing will work for the um, multiplicative side. I'm only doing the additive side because it's just essentially repetition. Once you stick all that together, you get that there can't be too many good triples. Um, and I have a one, four, four here because that's 12 squared um, because of the A plus B over A from one term. Um, and so chucking the two quad results together, I get the result that there can't be too many good triples. And also the result that there has to be a fair amount of good triples, which is the half thing we talked about earlier. And you chuck those two results together and you get the proof we needed. So the key idea of this proof was, well, I need to look at the good triples in two different ways. I need to look at them directly, um, in particular by fixing B and Q and looking at how many choices of A I can have. And I need to do it by making this injective transformation and counting on that side. And the idea of the choices is just encapsulated by the sigma thing, 
Um, and yeah, like I said, when you chuck those two results together, we get the proof that we wanted. Um, you might notice that I've written 144 here, um, but earlier I said 288. That's because um, in both of these cases, I've omitted some of the requirements such as Q doesn't contain zero, A has to be at least two and stuff like that um, because they're not very illustrative. The idea is just as long as these sets are not stupidly small. And once you allow for those things, then I've got two and a one for four here, which are going to combine to make the 288, which we had here. And then to insist that zero can be in Q, I need to sacrifice to get to a 576. Um, but then I, at the beginning, I said I've got a fifth. Well, what, what's going to turn out is um, I'm going to take a fourth root of this number in order to get a five over four in the exponent. And the fourth root of five, seven, six is close to a fifth, or it's close to five. And so that's good enough to get the bound. So I could have stated the result as the fourth root of, sorry, the fourth root of one over five, seven, six, but it's easier to state it as a fifth and it gives me a nice looking result of a fifth here. Two root six, right? Yeah. Um, but I think it's slightly nicer to see it as a fifth. Yeah, yeah. Um, and even if, um, even if I did want to be more precise with, with how this is stated, it doesn't really make much difference to the power of the result, uh, no pun intended, because it's the power that matters here, the five over four. So this is conjectured not to be at all optimal anyway, right? Exactly. Exactly, yeah. Because ultimately, we, we want this to be much bigger. And in fact, we know it's not optimal because we know we can get four thirds anyway. Um, so yeah, what's, what's left now? Well, now that this has been proven, the most obvious thing is, can I get the complex version? So this is this thing we were just talking about, about angles. Um, if we do have enough stuff about how angles add um, in the complex numbers. Yeah, that was one of the things numbers. Joseph did, was that he proved oriented angles mod two pi did actually add. Okay. I, I need to look into that, which is why it's the top thing on the slide. <laughs> um, or if someone wants a project, then that's, that's a pretty accessible one, I think. Um, you essentially need to give a version of this real covering lemma, but you change this R and this R to C, you change this to seven, and the result should come straight out of that. Um, and if you like, the reason this is three is because when you look at, um, I said that if you have, Six, six complex numbers, one of the angles must be at least 60 degrees. In the real numbers, you can do the same thing. If you've got two points, one of the angles must be at least 180, which is a lot more obvious, um, but that's, that's all you need. The next, um, the next improvement is this four thirds, like I mentioned. Now, one thing you might be wondering is, why didn't I prove this? I, I gave this slide where I had these bounds. Um, now, probably if you have this sort of form, it's going to be tricky to prove. But one obvious question is why didn't I go for this version from 2009, um, Solimoshi's results? The answer to that is that I thought the proof was harder than it was. And I looked at it last week while I was preparing for this talk, and I realized it's actually pretty accessible. So the reason I didn't is essentially a mistake. And this is probably fairly doable. Um, if, if someone has the time to get to this improved bound. Um, make, making the improvements further, I think is gonna be trickier because those proofs are a fair amount more involved. Um, but yeah, getting to the 2009 result is fairly accessible. Um, the next thing one could look at is other additive combinatorics. For example, the multiplication table problem I mentioned earlier. Um, one thing which is quite cool to look at is the Freiman Rouge theorem. So, just to recall, this is the one which classifies um, sets of small doubling in the integers. Um, and the Brouillard Green Tau theorem might be a lot trickier. Um, the paper itself is about 90 pages and it relies on a whole bunch of other stuff. So, that's a lot less accessible. But if someone has you know, enough time and money, I guess it would be really cool to have such a recent result done. 
so yeah, these two things I mentioned in the middle, um, Soil Emotion's four thirds proof and parts of Freiman Rouge are completely accessible now. Uh, so I mentioned it goes via geometry of numbers. There's stuff like Minkowski's second theorem, I think either in MathLib or in Piaster MathLib. Um, the stuff about finite fields are all in MathLib. And the proof also breaks down to a fair amount of nice components. So that could be a really interesting project if someone wants one. Um, for example, Rouge's triangle inequality, I think it's been mentioned before as a project. And that's an important part of the proof, which um, is a nice self-contained project. Um, but yeah, that's where I'll leave it. That's um, hopefully an interesting summary of additive combinatorics and how to formalize it in Lean. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Pavic. Uh, I'll stop recording uh, and then I'll ask if there's any questions. Sure.